And welcome into the Bobby Carpenter Show. We've got a huge show for you today. We're going to sit down and chat a little bit with Buckeye linebacker C.J. Hicks. See what he's got going on this summer. His transition through Ohio State, playing a little linebacker here, being an Ohio guy, Dayton guy in Columbus and how that's kind of impacted him. Got the rankings out for the individual players for the NCAA uh, college football game. Excited to hear about that. Um, maybe in a little little nugget with some of the linebackers of where they're rated, where they're coming. Is there more realignment coming? Who knows? And then we always got our tailgate talk questions from listeners. Uh, I want to mention this, though. A couple of earlier shows talked about uh, my racehorse. I wanted to clarify, if you're hearing this for the first time, you might be more interested in getting some more uh, information. You want to visit, get involved with my racehorse, you want to go to bigplay.com slash horse. Uh, as Burst is going to the My Racehorse website. The reason it's recommended for our big play folks is visiting bigplay.com slash horse. It's because on this page, there's going to be some more context around the partnership with My Racehorse. And to be completely transparent, Big Play and My Racehorse have an exciting new partnership that is in place. So everybody's really pumped about it. Uh, big Play is receiving some compensation to produce, promote My Racehorse and the brand. And uh, Leana Lock in uh, 22. All of the information about this partnership can be found on the URL. That's the website, bigplay.com slash horse uh, for all the proper legal disclo disclosures are going to be posted. Again, just want to be completely transparent with all that as you embark on this exciting new journey, hopefully with us. Now, all right, let's start off the show diving into this, Joshua. Uh, Chip Kelly, this came out that he is going to be calling plays. That was known. Ryan's going to take a step back from that, more of a CEO coach's role. But he's going to be calling plays not from the box, but from the sideline this year. Good move, bad move, big deal, no deal. How do you kind of look at this? I don't know if it's a huge deal, right? Because uh, Ryan Day had been doing it. And, um, you know, I think, I think some coordinators just have a, a really good feel and a pulse for – what's going on and what they can see from down there. And it kind of keeps them in the rhythm of everything. So I understand that. Uh, I know there's some guys that just have the preference of being up top where it's a, you know, a little bit more of a sterile environment, uh, very controlled up there. They can see from a different vantage point. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily have any feelings about that. I'm curious who else is going to be down on the sideline versus who's going to be upstairs. It's usually um, how I kind of, you know, figure out who's got what responsibilities. But the idea that he's going to be down there calling plays, I don't think is is a huge thing for me. It's it's not. But one of the things that does bring up is, like you said, what's going to be the split of who's upstairs versus who's downstairs. And if he's down there, Ryan's down there, that's great. Because I think there'll be some phenomenal communication between them. Yep. It's really tough, in my opinion, to call plays from the sideline. I mean, some guys, some guys do that in the NFL. Usually it's a head coach if they're doing it. Just because you don't have the vantage point, Joshua, to be able to see, like players know when you're looking at it from ground level, it's not like watching the game on television where you have that aerial shot and you're like, oh, this is where the secondary is rolling. These are the splits. This is where the linebackers are at. So you have to have somebody that you really trust. Now, Chip has called plays from the sideline as a head coach, and I think there's a confidence in it, but I'm just curious how that relationship's going to work with the coaching staff and who's going to be upstairs versus who's down low. Well, I think the, the you know, head coach play caller thing from Chip Kelly's pass is a huge reason why I'm, I'm not going to say that this is a, a big thing because he's so used to it. Like it might be a little bit of an adjustment for him to go back upstairs and, and try to see everything from there and relay the communication down to the field that way. Um, and, and like I said, man, like for some of these guys, it's just like the idea of being down there in the mix, in the chaos is like, you know, it allows them to lock in in a different way. Um, you know, like. I think with the wide receiver room, you certainly like to have that guy down on the sidelines to be able to get his substitutions communicated to his guys, make the adjustments down there. Um, you know, the offensive line is a huge group. And so for that reason, you like to have that coach down there. Um, I don't know if if Locke is a guy that you would put upstairs on the offensive side. I, like, I'm, I'm just, that's where I'm yeah. really trying to figure out. It feels like they're going to be a lot of offensive bodies that are going to be on the sidelines. You know, it just kind of hit me with this. The fact that they can now have basically the limitless coaches that are allowed for both tactical, tactical and technical instruction. Sure. It seems like you might 
have most of your coaches, unless they have a preference to be upstairs, those guys might be down on the field now with maybe more of the analysts being involved upstairs and being able to provide that bird's eye view. You got to, you got to have a deep trust in whoever is upstairs. Though, Big if trust that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. One of those. Exactly. Absolutely. You take it out to Baltimore with that. Um, you, you, you got to have like the communications got to be Chris. This is one of those things. And, and, and you know how it goes in preseason where, um, they'll do the mock games in the horseshoe. And, and I don't know how many they'll do. It's going to be at least one might do a couple times in there. The reason you do it, you guys get a feel of being in the locker room, running out in the field and all that kind of jazz, whatever the case is, you do it for them. You do it so you can practice the communication from upstairs down to the sideline to getting to play to the quarterback might be over the headset this time, right? Different than in years past. So I think there are some moving pieces involved. Yeah, um, it's going to be interesting. Like you said, there's got to be that trust. There has to be that communication. I, I'm I'm guessing now just after thinking about that, Joshua, I think that that is the play where you have some of those analysts that are probably going to be or you know quality control guys that are probably going to be up there in the box. And that's a lot of what their job was before of breaking down films. So they're going to have a good feeling. It's just that relationship, the communication, being able to get quickly down. What do those defensive fronts look like? I think Jim Knowles will stay in the box. He's a guy yes. that likes to be kind of isolated. And this is usually the thing for the most coordinators is, Joshua, they like to kind of be extracted from the fray yep. because the emotional element of being on the field and everybody kind of going around, calling a play, it's, it's more or less like playing video games. I mean, what you see and you want kind of that sterile environment to be to be up there where you're not like pulled in by the emotions of the game, which, as you know, can get kind of heated on the sideline. And, I mean, you were there for – uh, that 2015 year with Urban, where some of the play calling dynamics, if you will, the uh, procedures man. weren't exactly uh, butter smooth. No, and, and that was a year where Urban probably went through more headsets than usual. He he had the throwing of the headset down to a science, the one hand on the earpiece, the other hand around the waist, and just as coordinated as could be, you'd see the toss and there's Bolt, there's Quinn, somebody has to go and find the headset and see if it's still alive. By the way, is there a worst? Like they used to have cord guy, and since now they're all wireless, you don't have that. But you still, the cord guy was also kind of the head coach's get back coach yeah. since they kind of roam around. I mean, is there a worse job in all of sports than that that position? I, it's it's got to be kind of bad because the coach is always shooing you, like you you're doing your job, but you're never right doing it. And I can remember there were times where they would have Urban by the belt loop, like the finger was hooked in the loop to make sure he wasn't straying too far onto the field. And it's a thankless job, but it's necessary in college football and the pros, really. Well, the best part is, is it's like you said, it's a no win. If you're doing your job well, you're keeping him off the field, keeping him out of trouble. If you don't do it well and they get a 15-yarder, then you're getting yelled at by the head coach as to why you didn't weren't able to restrain them more. It's, yeah, it's why, really didn't, why didn't you regulate my emotions for me? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's basically like you're dealing with like a two or three year old because during the game, they want to go out and yell at the ref, they're like out to the numbers, refs warning them, all these different things. And poor guy's just sitting there trying to do his job. And whether that was Volt for a while, Quinn, I'm not sure who does it. And Ryan's a little better. I mean, Urban he might is. be the, the worst <laughs> dude to do it for. He was but, a habitual line stepper, figuratively <laughs> and literally. <laughs> uh, R.I.P. Charlie Murphy's birthday was uh, last week. I think he was born on the 11th or the the 12th. And so the habitual line stepper, Charlie Murphy with Rick James, immortalized uh, for all time. Joshua is one, one of the great Chappelle show skits. Um, big show, like I mentioned linebacker we got a three banger of linebackers on here coming up next we're going to sit down with cj hicks talk about his journey at ohio state on the bobby carpenter show and welcome back into the bobby carpenter show and as always we get some wonderful buckeye guests and it's a big linebacker day had on cody simon before so that was fun now we're going to get one of his other linebacker mates C.J. Hicks joining the program. Uh, Kettering Alter guy, Dayton's own. C.J., thanks for spending some time with us today. Uh, how has this summer been going for you so far? Well, the summer's been great. You know, um, the whole team, I feel like we're coming together well. 
everybody's gelling well with all the new transfers. I feel like this is probably like the most, the closest team has ever been since I've been here. You know, there's no really young guys. The only young guys that you can really say are like, is like Caleb and JJ, but we all know that they're far beyond young. So yeah, yeah, I feel like the summer's been great. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> those guys are far beyond young. For sure. And the, the best teams I were on were close teams. So it's definitely a good thing to hear about that. Now, Bobby mentioned, uh, you know, you're a guy from the state of Ohio. Um, you know, it, I think it's it's a little bit different going to Ohio State when when you watch it your whole life growing up. So what is it like for you on Saturdays when you get to put on the scarlet and gray? No, it's great. Growing up, my favorite players, um, Braxton Miller, you know, Ezekiel Elliott. You know, Ryan Shazier, I used to watch guys like that all the time, especially like from my area, you know, Rob Lander, just my cousin. And then Braxton being up down the road, you know, um, it's a true blessing. And then my first time ever putting the uniform on, I did feel a little pressure because of the fact like it's, it's real. It was hitting me all at once. But now, you know, it's just it's great to just put on from the state that I'm from and just to represent everything. So. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been fun watching you grow. And every time, anytime you get you know, Ohio guys, obviously on Ohio State, it's a big deal. Uh, you know, it feels important. Obviously, and you talked about the veteran element as well with this team. You know, you're going to be a junior. Cody's been here five years. You know, what what's the linebacker room like after losing you know, Tommy and Steele, guys that have been there for a number of years? I mean, you guys aren't young. You've you've played some. Cody's played a little more. There's some experience, but what has been the turnover like in that room and and kind of that new leadership role that you know, Cody and yourself and, and even Sonny are kind of are starting to absorb? You no, know, um, I feel like Tommy and Steele set down a great foundation for us. Uh, I feel like now this room is more vocal, more competitive than it's ever been. You know, since Sonny's came down, everybody's competing, no matter what, who it is. You know, you got the young guys, you got G Stove and Peyton Pierce, you know, you got Arvell, you got Gabe, every, all of us are competing with each other every single day and we love it. Like now we're getting our like effort grades and Coach Lord and I is, the highest you can get is a five, but Coach Mick's never going to give anybody a five. But <laughs> of course not. Like the linebacker room is to have everybody over a 4.5. And I think this past week, there was only one guy who got a 4.4. Everybody else was above that. So it's been great. It's uh, the old page out of Luke Fickle playbook where you're not going to give anybody a five on the the effort scale because everybody can always do better there. But James Laurinaitis is a guy who's got a storied history um, at Ohio State. And I think a, a lot of fans were excited to see when he was named to the linebacker coach job. But uh, for you guys working with him every day, what has that experience been like? No, it's been great. Coach Laurinaitis is a great guy. He's definitely helped us on and off the field. You know, um, Everything he's done is what we want to be. We, we, every single linebacker in the room wants to be a Buckets Award winner. Um, we want to compete for a national championship, and that's the goal this year as well. And obviously, we want to play in the NFL. So um, just learning, like, the little things, little details, some things that you can pick up from offense, like what are the quarterbacks looking at, what are the running backs doing, things like that, the splits of the receivers and the tight ends. You know, he's, he's helped a lot for sure. You know, you've got a little bit of ink. James has a ton of ink. I mean, do you guys ever go back, talk to Coach Lorenice about those tattoos? I mean, maybe get some matching ones? No, we talk to him about it sometimes. We, um, He said when he was getting ready for the draft, I think, some of the other teams, I think it was um, Recruiter or whatever, but they called him Jimmy Tats. So we mess with him <laughs> and call him Jimmy Tats sometimes just to mess with him and all that stuff, so. That's pretty good stuff right there. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious about this, and I really haven't asked this question to any of the other guys on the defensive side that have been on the show, but um, Jim Knowles is unique, and, and his scheme is unique, the way that it's executed, the way guys move around. Um, you know, what's it been like sitting in a meeting room and hearing from him and, and you know, what, what goes through his head when he's designing a defense? Coach Knowles is probably one of the smartest people I've ever been around. Um, when you actually sit down and listen to him talk about the defense – and things that he sees is is really is like it's crazy because of the fact like he's he waits to like the very last second to give us a call when we're on the field because he wants it to be the perfect call and nine times out of ten it's the perfect call for the whatever the offense is about to run because of the fact he watched so much film and he's so involved in just to put everybody in the right position and he's great he's a great guy. How much uh, you know now that you've been here this will be your third year. You're going through you know multiple springs, multiple seasons. You know your approach to the game has it changed? Like just the comfortability, understanding everything. 
you know, when you're first getting there, it's always like, what's the call? But then as you kind of learn stuff, you look at everything, the communication's easier. How's that kind of progress been for you, CJ? It's been, it's got a lot better. You know, um, my freshman year, it was more of just, okay, now I'm just understanding my job, what I need to do right now. Um, last year was more of, okay, understanding the whole defense and understanding where everybody fits and where everybody can get plugged in at. And then now it's more of like anticipating on what the office is doing. That's our, that's our goal as linebackers. We want to know what's going on before the play even snap, before the ball is even snapped. And, um, I feel like we all have done a great job. Like we've been watching film already and preparing for the season. Who's been the guy this summer that's kind of taken on the role as, you know, the the vocal leader, whether it comes to workouts, whether it's encouraging guys to get in the film room, like who's been the one who's really leading the charge there? Cody Simon, you know, um, he's ever since everybody left last year, um, basically Tommy, Tommy was the leader last year, but now like Cody. Oh, man, Tommy, did, Tommy didn't even talk. Tommy didn't talk at all. <laughs> Tommy didn't talk, but Tommy was a great guy. And like in the linebacker room, he talked to us and, things to see and like there's basically just how to be comfortable when you're out there on the field and then you know weight room and things like that Tommy really didn't need to talk because of the fact like you just, you're working out and if you're not giving your all you look over and see Tommy he's blown out both shoulders and broken both hands and he's training and giving his all like it was one incident last year we were competing doing the 5-10-5 shuttle and I beat him he started punching himself in the head because he was mad he lost <laughs> but um yeah, Cody's definitely the guy who set up as the leader for the whole team. You know, he's pushing everybody to be great. It's the little details as well. So, like, we uh, when we're warming up and we take our shoes off, put our cleats on, and we're out there on the field, we have our cleats, our shoes lined up on the, the wall. And just now on the wall, Cody's going to say something about it and just push every leader to make sure you're focused on those little details and training when you're giving your, doing the workouts and things like that. So Cody's done a great job with that this year. Oh, so Cody's the one in charge. I'll tell you what, Joshua, it looks good. They're out there working out, and it's, like, lined up. I mean, everybody's mom would be proud, like, the shoes are hey, all man. right beside each other. You said his, his dad went to West Point, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that's that's bred inside of him. Like, he was born <laughs> to be a guy who had it all organized, ready to go. So, Mitch, we, uh, we talked to Mitchell last week, Melton, and he called him, what was it, Cobot or Corey the Robot? I mean, like, I mean, you guys, <laughs> you guys hammered him like that in the linebacker room? No, um, Sonny and I mess with him. We call him Captain America. But <laughs> that's about it, you know. Because, like, in all honesty, for all of us, especially like in the linebacker room, I feel like for – if you're looking at the whole defense, there's for starters returning everywhere besides the linebacker spots. So, for us as linebackers, we know what we're capable of. So, we just want to set that standard for the guys when we leave and then basically let the whole nation know that we're here. All right, I want to hang on that because that's a, it's important you brought that up. I think it's something that we're going to get into. We've got to take a quick, quick break, but we'll have more with C.J. Hicks right after this here on the Bobby Carver Show. All right, welcome back into the Bobby Carver Show. Sitting here talking with C.J. Hicks, and if you're like it, uh, watch on YouTube, please subscribe, like, uh, leave comments. We love getting interaction. Watch on Bally's. Thank you as well. And CJ you brought this up right before we had to go to break that there's pretty much the whole defensive line returning. Basically, the majority of the secondary returning and you know, even Caleb coming in, he was a starter last year. In you know, the linebacker room, Corey played a lot last year. You played some. You know, Sonny played safety, but this is kind of a unique mix where you guys are kind of the group with probably the least amount of playing experience, especially playing together. I mean, what is what are you guys trying to do, and, and what's been the messaging with Coach Laurinaitis to try to help develop some of that experience and that that cohesion? You know, um, a PFF grades came out and basically like ranking all the linebackers, and Coach Laurinaitis put it up on the board. I think we were like number ten in the country, and um, he said by the end of the season we need to be top three, and for all the linebackers are like, no, we need to be number one because of the fact we all know what we all are capable of doing. We all know that we're very versatile. We all can run. We all can hit. We all are smart and just top the run, do all that stuff. But it's just like how you said, we all need to gel together and come together. And I think I feel like we've done a great job with that. You know, Coach Larnatis is doing a good job just rotating guys. You know, you got me out there with Arvell. You got Sonny out there with Gabe. 
you got Cody out there with Sonny and whoever's out there, we're making sure that we're talking with each other and we're comfortable with each other. And basically we're all on the same page before the ball is done. Now you mentioned uh, you guys know how good you think this linebacker group can be. And I, I think everybody's looking at this defense and they're saying it can be really good. What are your conversations like inside the building? Like how good do you think you guys can be this year? No, I'm back around. We feel like we can be the best in the nation. Like the I just defense. Said. Uh, the defense, same thing, best in the nation. You know, um, I think the overall just came out for the game. I know it was just a game, but we're ranked 96. And that's the highest defense on the game. But, like, we all know, like, our goal is no team scoring a touchdown on us all season. Um, why not blow everybody out? Why not, you know, score points? If the offense is struggling, why not? Why can't we score points on defense, you know? Um, defense, you control the whole aspect of the game. So that's hard. Just everybody's mindset right now, just stopping the run, stopping the pass, stopping them from scoring touchdowns and scoring on touchdowns and force turnovers. So, you know, we talked a lot about football, but CJ, we like to try to like let people get inside a little bit of what, what's going on in the life of CJ Hicks. In the summer, you got a little more downtime. You know, Josh and I, we've talked to a lot of these guys, you know, they get into golf, whether they're good or not. People have been playing together streaming shows. I mean, how have you been filling up some of this time once you get done and leave the Woody? I mean, right now, me and Sonny were roommates, and we both just moved into our own apartments. So I'm really sitting in the apartment that we just moved out of because we got <laughs> little stuff out. But um, I really don't do much. Play the game. Um, I like to just sit outside and just enjoy the peace and quiet, you know, and look out and see what God made and things that he's blessed us with and just think about all that. And then watching film as well, just because of the fact, like how I said, the linebackers, we're all, we are the guys that are with the big old question mark on us. So just preparing for the season, things like that. All right. So I live in Chicago right now. And, and since moving to Chicago, I've actually got more of an appreciation for nature because it's all <laughs> hustle and bustle of the city. Uh, some great parks here in Chicago. I grew up in Columbus. I know Columbus. They got some great metro parks there. So when you're spending time, are you, are you just like sitting outside of your apartment complex or do you try to find some of like the, you know, the parts and more of the nature spots and just go off and, and hang out there? Uh, I'm more of a homebody. So I really just sit on the balcony and just chill. You know, um, my new spot, I don't have chairs yet. So I'm really just sitting on the <laughs> balcony, but it's nothing crazy. It's just, it's nice though, especially with the new area. I just moved around. It's nice. Nice. That's good. But you don't, you don't stream any shows. I mean, there's nothing that you're watching on, you know, Amazon, Netflix, whatever it is. Um, I really don't watch TV like that, but I did get done watching um, wide receivers on Netflix. Okay. And um, basically like watching how all of those top receivers like handle themselves and like how they approach the game. And then I was watching this, um, there was one, I think it was like episode seven, Devonte Adams was talking about like how, when he's watching certain corners and certain receivers, obviously you see what they're good at and what they're not good at, but also basically like the little details that the safeties do and the linebackers do. So you can basically alter your game and then, um, obviously you can do the same thing from linebacker. So I just try to implement those little things. The, um, the game is, is much more than just, you know, out on the field in the film room, there's a strength and conditioning component of it as well. And I was a guy who got coached by Mickey Marotti. I was a guy who got coached by Anthony Schlegel. Um, I know exactly how crazy that stuff is, but, uh, you know, give us a window into to Mickey and give us a window into Schlegs. Like, what's it like being around those guys? It's great, you know, um, especially Schlegs. He he, um, <laughs> he was with us for the winter and then the spring, and then he just left this past week, but he's been great. You know, um, Coach Mick is always great. Coach Mick, you know, he's the standard in the weight room. And then all the other strength and conditioning coaches, you know, um, all of us know what like we need to do. Everybody's goal is to get over a 4.5 effort grade. But at the end of the day, like when you're working out with Slags or Coach Make or KP or any of the other guys, it's, some guys get mad because of the fact they're lifting with Slags because Slags brings so much energy and he makes <laughs> you do the little details or his own little thing. And he's always yeah. screaming. And Coach makes it a little, he's more like, 
he's on you, but he's more like chill and mellow because he's looking at everybody in the weight room. But everybody r- really didn't like lifting with shakes. Linebackers love lifting with shakes because, you know, we're trying to get better. But yeah. Schlegs, Schlegs will go off script for sure. <laughs> like he's a for guy sure. who, for sure. who, would, who would mix and match his little, you know, whatever he wanted to do. And uh, Coach KP was a little bit like that too. I don't know if he's still like that, but before he used to he used to add on a little razzle dazzle to some of the workouts. Yeah, KP he um he just had surgery on his hip, I think hip or his leg. But that's why Slags was here. But um yeah, Slags he he has his own little warm up. Um, some of the interns are like, that's not on the list. He's like, I don't care. Let's get bumping. He just yells at all, <laughs> all the time. So it's not on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Let's get bumpy. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, you know, he loves going off script uh, for sure, yeah. man. Definitely entertaining guy. Um, you know, you being an Ohio guy, CJ, I want to finish up with this. You know, obviously if the close of the season last the last couple of years, not winning the uh, not winning the game, uh, th- that's tough against the team up north. What being an Ohio guy, you know, what have you have you learned anything more? about the rivalry being here has it changed in your mind from just when you were in high school to what it is now being the fact that you play in it just as an Ohio guy you've been exposed to it probably a lot more than you know many of the other guys who came in from out of state so how has that kind of impacted it for you it really hasn't changed that much besides the fact how now I'm in it you know um we prepare all year and growing up, I always used to watch the Ohio State videos on YouTube and on their Instagram pages on how serious they took all of it. But like now when you're actually in it and you understand like what it means to everybody instead of just you because of the fact you are from Ohio, it makes you want to fight even harder because of the fact that it's not just you or the name on your back it's the whole state it's the whole team it's everybody's family across the country it's all those fans that are at home watching all the little kids that are striving to be just like you when they get older they're fighting for those guys so all of us i feel like for me my thing is because of the fact i am from ohio um just trying to win the last few that i, I am here because it, it's big i don't want to be one of those guys that leave here without getting a pair of go pants. Absolutely. Well, CJ, man, it's been a pleasure. We really appreciate you taking some time with us. Very, very talented young man. I'm excited to see uh, this big junior season for you and how that ultimately looks. So we really appreciate it today, all right? Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Hey, appreciate it. Coming up next, we're going to break down the player rankings for the EA Sports NCAA game. Might be surprised where some of these guys are coming in. All up next on the Bobby Carpenter Show. Welcome back into the program. CJ Hicks, phenomenal job there. Great, very responsible and respectful young man. Um, he's, he's been a joy to watch and watch him grow. And he's getting really, really improving as a player, Josh. We had a pretty good spring and excited to watch what that kind of rotation looks like with him, Cody, and uh, Sonny Styles this season here with Ohio State. Yeah, I mean, he's one of the guys that I think a, a lot of people are excited to see the growth from. And and if he can have a big year, as well as the other linebackers, and we talked about it during the interview, right? It's a little bit the, the most unknown part of the defense. But if they can have a big year, I mean, it's it's going to be crazy on that side of the ball. Oh, uh, absolutely. And CJ dropped us a little nugget before he got off um, the air, told us this when he, when he uh, left. All three linebackers, I, we say above 85, he was an 85. Cody was the highest at 87. And Sonny Styles sitting there at an 86. Um, I'm curious to see, do they will they adjust those rankings throughout the season, Joshua? Do you know if that's a flexible thing? I have no idea. They should, but I don't know if that's a, a thing that they do. Just, I mean, you know, Cody, he's played a lot. He's played the most of all of them at linebackers. Sonny obviously started at safety last year. I feel like Sonny's though progress this season he will grow immensely just given the fact that he'll be getting more and more comfortable settling into that position. Yeah, it's going to be fun, right? Like, I mean, it's, as you said, it's an adjustment. I think he's been adjusting all spring, but uh, as you look at it, the body type seems right. Coverage ability is going to translate right away. And it's just a matter of, of really learning how to play the game like a linebacker, but the sky is the limit for that dude. Like he, I mean, it's, it's, 
you start looking at guys who are in the NFL really making plays and in, in physically, like body type wise, a lot of those guys look like Sonny. So that's what's exciting to me. Well, it's it's tremendous. Um, so he's ranked at 86. Now, Jeremiah Smith coming in at 84, the talented freshman wide receiver. I mean, I think that it's rumored that that's the highest ranking of any freshman. Um, Cause I feel like he's another guy that could have a, a large Delta during the season. Should he start yeah. playing well? In 92, right? Like, yeah. I mean, the, from the, the clips that I've seen, the stories that I've heard, you, you got to be conservative when you're giving out the, the evaluations on the freshman, how you rank them in the game. But I think throughout the year, he's probably going to play out play in 84 pretty easily. So Buckeyes have eight players in the top 100. That is the most of anyone in the country. Gosh, I ran through this. And I had them written down, and I, I, I lost the list somewhere. Um, Caleb Downs, I think, is the highest-rated Buckeye, if I'm not mistaken. He's one of the gentlemen that's on that list. Yeah, I saw Caleb up there pretty high. Um, Quinshawn as well, right? And Mecca in the mix there. So, um, you know, you got a couple transfer guys. You got a Mecca who came back, which was huge. Like, And every time I see something like this, I think it, it points to what everybody's been talking about this offseason, the the expectations of this Ohio State program and where they should be at the end of the year. And it's it's hoisting the trophy. And I know that's uh, a lot to deal with. And there's there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Those guys inside the building certainly don't need to be thinking about that right now. They need to figure out how you're going to win game one. But for us on the outside, it's really hard to avoid the collection of talent. It is immense. And the idea that this team, if, if they execute game after game, it's going to be a really special year. It is uh, also up there. Um, Judkins, second highest ranked Buckeye, tied with Caleb. He's a 95. You mentioned Mecca. I think uh, Donovan Jackson is the other player on the offensive side. And then defensively, and we mentioned Caleb. You've got Jack Sawyer, I believe, on that list. I think Ty Leak. And then Denzel. Denzel's got to be in there. If I'm not mistaken. I think I've got them all. Like I, I feel like I ran through this the other day. And I'm not sure if Trey Henderson was on there or not. He was maybe just outside if he wasn't sitting right there. But I think I've got, if you gave me like nine or ten guesses, I think I could get all eight. But, I mean, it really should be no surprise. We've seen all the talent here. You see a defense that's ranked 96. We, you heard, And it's funny. I mean, how wild was that? It's CJ Hicks, like, and he's – talking about, you know, their defense and how good they are. And he just references the game <laughs> rate rating. Like that's as if that's like, Hey, cause that's the thoughts. I mean, I mean, they're putting that together. I mean, that's kind of how you're ranking yourself. I mean, we miss a, a decade of, of guys being able to compare real life to the video game, which was a travesty. And so I'm glad we're back in that spot there. Uh, one of the guys that you name, man, um, in Ty Lee, like all the conversation nationally about, great defensive players and, you know, who are guys that are going to be high draft picks. I feel like his name does not pop up nearly enough. And, and if you've watched him, we've seen him. Um, obviously our fan base is very um, familiar with him, but like, I think this year nationally, he has an opportunity to really capture some narrative about the best defensive players in the country. Absolutely. And it's because you play that defensive tackle position I mean, it's not really a glory position. You're always looking at the ends, the edge rushers. And it, it was – he was very, very disruptive last year. I thought played well. It's going to be interesting to watch him, uh, Ty Hamilton inside to see how those guys play. I mean, they're going to have a rotation of bodies. I think Larry can probably go eight or nine guys deep. And I, I expect a lot from that that first group of guys with JT and Jack. And then you got – I call them the D-Ties inside – with what they're going to be able to do. But you know, they're ranked highly. The defense is ranked highly. They should be because all the four guys I mentioned right there, I mean, those are all four-year four year players. I mean, they've been at Ohio State for a while, maybe even five for someone. But they've, they've been here for a while. They've played. They've started. They're very, very talented. And so there's really no reason why this defense shouldn't be the best in the country. I love how confident C.J. Hicks was talking about that. You know, their goals, like aspirationally, how good that linebacker unit needs to be. I think he said PFF had him 10th, like top, James said top three. It's like, why not number one? And that's that's the mentality that you want to have. And that's awesome that they believe that, they understand it. And it's great to see that Corey, or Cody rather, has been leading the charge there with that defense. So 
big deal. All right, coming up next, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to get into some tailgate talk, which is one of our favorites, brought to you by Garage Beer, answering your questions. Um, got some interest, interesting ones coming up since the season is right around the corner. Stay tuned here on the Bobby Carpenter Show. We were called soft last year. You don't want to be soft, especially when you come to the playoffs. So that's going to be a process throughout this season of establishing us as a harder team here in the They're off in the Kentucky Derby. As authentic takes them around the far turn. Tis the laws making his move now. And they're into the stretch. These two strive for stride. Authentic. Tis the law. Here's the wire. Authentic has won the Kentucky Derby. All right, welcome back into the show, and it's our favorite segment we do each and every week. Tailgate Talk is brought to you by our friends at Garage Beer. Garage Beer, the perfect beer for you all summer long for all your get-togethers. Cookout, Garage Beer, Family Reunion, Garage Beer, doing yard work, Garage Beer. I was hanging out at the river, had some Garage Beer this weekend. So go buy some Garage Beer. It's beer-flavored beer, just what you're looking for. All right, Joshua, I saw this come in, and I don't know if it was a question as much as it was a comment. Um... Buckeye HQ said he just changed the away uniforms for Ohio State to the all whites, the cocaine whites uh, for his team. He's like, don't tell B Carp, Bobby Carpenter Show, Josh Perry, everybody. I don't know if he thought we'd get mad or what, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm a, I'm a uniform traditionalist. But I do really enjoy the all-whites for the away games. If it's a big game and you want to rock them all, I guess it's maybe after, like, remembering Braxton. Was that 2013 you guys wore the all-whites yes. up there? Yeah. Yep. I mean, the cocaine whites against Michigan are looking nice. It's the best uniform, right? Like, out, outside of the traditional. If we're going alternate uniforms, the all-white was the greatest thing that I've ever put on. It was amazing. Uh, we had the all black uniforms. I am not young enough to have experienced the all scarlet uniforms. We've seen the other iterations, some of the throwback jerseys that they have done. Good looking jerseys. I'm not trying to say that the stuff doesn't look great, but the all white and you feel you feel a different way when you're playing in all white. I'm untouchable right now and it's phenomenal. It is. It's a good look. And that's I don't know why someone get mad. I, I liked the traditional home like Scarlet jersey. I'd like the grays on the, the gray on the sleeve would be nice. I'm fine with it. All black for one offs every now and again isn't a big deal, but I wouldn't mind if they threw that all white for the big games, away games, like that are critical ones. It looks good. You look fast. You look explosive. Like there's just something about it. you can wear the high white socks with them. Oh yeah, it's, it's a whole it's a whole fit. And I just I remember Braxton just sprinting down the field like for 60 yards for a touchdown on one of his like 37 Q powers that they ran that game. No, and then there was a, the one of uh, Jeff Hireman going into the end yeah. zone and then Philly Brown is up on his shoulders. And it just like that looks better with all white on. And to your point, the all black I do think is cool, but it does feel a little bit like a funeral. And you're just hoping that it's not yours that day. Like you, you put on the all black and you're like, I hope this is not my funeral that I'm going to. And that's like, cause there's other schools that like incorporate black into their jerseys. And like, it feels kind of Nebraska-ish or like other, other schools. Like when I turn on Ohio state, Bo Bishop always says this, when you turn on the TV, you should want to be able to instantly recognize your team. If you have one of the most iconic uniforms in all of sports. And I feel like that Ohio state helmet is, and the jersey is. And if you go to the all whites, I feel like that doesn't detract from it. But wearing like the all black, it takes me a minute if I'm surfing around to kind of figure out what it is. Now, one of the quick details I will say that I appreciate about some of the alternates that we wore is instead of the regular green Buckeye leaves, they would have neon leaves like they would yeah. shimmer a little bit more. And those were fire, like the coolest thing ever. Absolutely. And I do. I do like those as well. 
uh, the the different jerseys, or the different helmets with the little black with the sparkling red and everything. Those those are sick, and the the Buckeye leaves do come to play when you do that. All right, we're gonna wrap up the show next. We got our closing segment. We got some quick hitters coming out, maybe about conference realignment and a funny story too about a tennis star that I want to get into. All here next on the Bobby Carpenter Show. All right, welcome in. Final segment of the program. We got a little quick hitter for you, Josh. Where there's some rumors, and we'll probably dive into this a little more next week and let it breathe some. Uh, rumors com- coming out that Big 12, I think they're always open for business. Um, according to your mark, their, uh, their um, co- conference commissioner, but looking to maybe add Florida State and Clemson, possibly a couple other ACC schools if they can get out. If they did that, would the conference be – an equal third in your mind to the Big Ten and SEC? I think it'd be pretty damn close. I, I don't know if I can I can say it's an equal third, but like that would be, I think, a huge deal. And, and my whole thing about the Big 12 this whole time is like, does it feel like the Big Ten, the SEC? No. Do I feel the stability of the Big Ten in the SEC? Yes. I felt like the moves that they made were certainly survival moves, but it provided a lot of stability. So now they're in a good spot. And if you're Clemson, if you're Florida State, and you feel like there's not stability in your conference, I feel like that could be a nice landing place. So you put them there. uh, You got Utah, uh, Colorado, the Arizona schools as new additions as well. Feels pretty solid. You could get uh, traditional ACC power SMU. In the Big 12 geographically, it would make a lot of sense to put them there. Uh, nope. You know, you got Kansas State, who, who you know, they got some good years in their TCU. That feels like a solid conference to me. It does. The, the SMU thing. I mean, they SMU literally, you know, just they, they had the biggest power move of anybody saying, we'll go to the the ACC. Don't even give us a, a money. A, <laughs> for free. A TV share. We'll do it for free. We'll do it for free. And by the way. We're going to be ranked like 20th this year. We might win the ACC or at least be playing in the conference championship game. I don't even know how that works. I know that there's some deep-rooted issues with the Big 12, with them going back to the Southwest Conference days and pony excess and everything else. Um, Before we get you out of here, Joshua, in an interview on Hot Ones, Serena Williams uh, revealed she once tried to deposit a million-dollar check just like casually going through a bank drive through like you could drop that in a little slip. I love her honesty and candor about this. I mean, she's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And why wouldn't you think that that's a normal thing to do? Hey, it's better than me because I, I thought I could mobile deposit a six figure check at one point in my young career. And the app was like, nah, dummy, go into the bank. Like you can't do this here. And so like, at least she was actually at the bank. Now you probably want to walk up to the window, but I get it. You know, they, they've dramatically increased the, the limits for the mobile deposits, Joshua. I don't think you're really cracking six figures. Maybe some banks might be like barely on six figures, but you know what? That's neither here nor there. We are all out of time for today. Thank you for tuning into this edition of the Bobby Carpenter Show. We will see you next week. We were called soft last year. You don't want to be soft, especially when you come to the playoffs. So that's going to be a process throughout this season of establishing us as a harder team here in the They're off in the Kentucky Derby. As authentic takes them around the far turn. Tis the laws making his move now. And they're into the stretch. These two strive for stride.